uh, I'd like to start by thanking the, the patients and participants for our, our studies in, in particular. It's really humbling how uh, uh, people have been involved, whether that's just giving a history or examination or giving blood sample or giving sometimes a skin biopsy or being involved in some of our clinical trials. These are significant levels of involvement and, it, and I, I don't cease to be um, touched by that, so thank you. The, the work uh, that, that we do within uh, our dermatology clinical research happens within the, the Oxford Biomedical Research Centre, which I, I think probably most of you are, are uh, aware of. Um, but the, the Oxford BRC, Oxford Biomedical Research Centre, facilitates and supports clinical research. And it does this across a number of different specialties, really covering a wide area of, of medical need. And we sit within the immunity and inflammation theme of the, of the BRC. And within the immunity and inflammation theme of the, the BRC, we sit alongside other, other specialists. So this is obviously us here. Uh, there are, are uh, gastroenterologists and liver specialists, uh, lung specialists, joints, uh, uh, renal, kidneys, and, and brain. And the, the BRC really brings us all together so that we can share information, share knowledge, uh, and try and understand what might be similar or different between our different specialties in order to try and understand disease in, in more detail and try and develop better, better treatments. So the dermatology, is, as many of you may know, is within the Churchill Hospital, just a stone's throw uh, uh, in, in that direction. Uh, and, uh, and we have a very busy department. We see around 40,000 patients a year. And around half of those patients will have some sort of inflammation of the skin. And I'll talk about that a bit more as we go through. And then the research happens at the Weatherall Institute of Molecular Medicine. And that's on the John Radcliffe site. And I spend a lot of my time cycling between these two uh, places. And I downloaded this picture because I thought that this is sort of a pretty close approximation to what I might look like on my bike as I went through. But my wife, when she had a look at the slides, thought that it might need a little bit of fine tuning this picture, just a, a slight adjustment. So she found this picture, which she thought was a more, <laughs> more accurate representation. It might be true, especially trying to come up Headington Hill from time to time. So atopic eczema, also known as atopic dermatitis, is, is extremely common. Uh, many of you all have had it or know people who, who, who have it, uh, friends or family. In fact, it affects up to 20 to 30 percent of children in the United Kingdom. And in our department, it probably accounts for around 10 or 15 percent or so of the patients that we see. And uh, in, in general practice, dermatology in general accounts for around 10 percent or so of the patients that general practitioners will tend to see. And atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis will be about a third of that. So it's an enormous burden on patients, on their families, and also for the, for, uh, uh, for, for the NHS as a whole. And what we, we see is, as I think most of you will know, in, if you look at an individual lesion of atopic eczema, atopic dermatitis, we see a number of different features. We'll see redness. And the reason that the skin is red is because the, the, the superficial blood vessels supplying the skin are dilated, they're opened. So there's more blood circulating very close to the surface of the skin, so it becomes red. You might see little bumps or, uh, or vesicles, tiny blisters with a, a drop of clear liquid in, in, inside. And that's because there's fluid in the, in the superficial skin. And I'll show you some more pictures about that, that later. Sometimes you can see flaking or scaling of the skin. And, and that flaking is, is due to uh, a, a, a abnormality in how the skin is lifting away. So normally, as you, as you know, the skin is constantly turning over. Uh, but uh, if it doesn't lift away in a controlled way, then it can have a, a flaking appearance. We also see the thickening uh, and uh, more marked skin creases. We call that lichenification. And that can be part of the condition, but it can also be a, a secondary response to rubbing of the skin. So that's the first clue that this is an itchy skin condition. And we can also see evidence where the, the, the superficial layer of the skin is lost. It's been scratched. So that's another clue that there's this excoriation, scratch marks, that this is a very itchy skin condition. Atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis can be linked with other atopic diseases. And those include some forms of asthma, 
rhinitis, also, also known as hay fever, and food allergy. And we think the overall um, uh, nature of the disease is that it starts with a slightly weakened skin barrier. And I'll come on to a lot more detail in a moment, but really just to set the scene. We think there might be a slightly weakened skin barrier, and then things in the environment then can enter into the skin at, at greater amounts than would normally be uh, uh, accepted. And that's detected by the immune system. And there's immune response in the skin then, which causes inflammation, which leads to the, to the disease. And when we see a patient with what we think is atopic eczema, atopic dermatitis, we first have to distinguish that or try to distinguish that from other forms of dermatitis. So there's other ways in which the skin can react to have that same clinical appearance. But it's important to distinguish atopic eczema from these other types of dermatitis or other types of eczema because they often have different causes and different uh, ways of treating. So irritant eczema or irritant dermatitis, as the name suggests, is due to irritant exposure on the skin. And the, the, the typical site for that would be on the hands, where our hands are exposed to detergents, soaps, uh, and, so, and have a lot of wear and tear, and so it's very susceptible to having irritant dermatitis. Allergic contact dermatitis, again, like irritant dermatitis, another very co common form of dermatitis, is where people have an allergic reaction to something coming into direct contact with the skin. So examples of that would be reactions to jewellery or reactions to fragrances or certain um, preservatives in cosmetics or, in, in fact, in some of the treatments that we use, some of the creams that we use for patients. Seborrheic eczema is a type of eczema on the face, around the sides of the nose. Um, it seems to be an overreaction to certain yeasts that are normally on the skin. Discoid eczema, as the name suggests, is associated with round areas of eczema, typically on the limbs. Pomphylix, again, very common type of eczema, which many of you may have had once or many times, where itchy um, blisters, small blisters, appear on the hands or on the, uh, on the palms particularly, sometimes on the fingers, sometimes on the feet. Stasis eczema is, is eczema where um, uh, it's particularly on the lower legs, where there might be a history of varicose veins, for example, where the blood flow isn't so good back from the lower legs, so tissue fluid collects on the lower legs, and that can result in eczema. And then astyototic eczema is eczema associated with very dry skin. So if, if, you, if you make skin very dry, eventually it will start to, to have the appearance of eczema. But as I said, the timing the, the, and also the distribution um, uh, and the age of onset would allow us to help, to help us distinguish these forms of eczema or dermatitis from atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis, which is the commonest type of eczema. So what I thought I'd do in the presentation would, was to um, try and uh, answer some of these questions. Firstly, what do people with atopic eczema react to? What are the things in the environment that are getting through the weakened barrier uh, and uh, that, that, are, that are the commonest things that people react to? And why are we seeing or have we seen increased frequency of, of eczema over the last 20 or 30 years. The incidence has probably increased two or threefold. It's probably now stabilizing in the UK, but there has been a dramatic increase, uh, and it is increasing in other countries across the world. So then also uh, try and answer why people react, or at least why we think people react to these things in the environment, how their immune system is reacting, and what we're trying to do to understand this process and, and what clinical trials we're trying to do to, to help patients. So firstly, what, what do people with atopic eczema react to? Well, um, we, we see patients uh, in, in a dermatology department who, who have, who have uh, eczema, atopic eczema, and they also, some people also have allergies to food. People with atopic eczema tend to react on the whole to things in the air, airborne allergens. And the commonest airborne allergens would be animal hairs, house dust mite, molds, and pollens. So these are things which we're all exposed to either all of the time or, or seasonally, which we can't see, but are landing on our skin, are, are, we're inhaling, and, uh, and some people can make reactions to these things, and others don't, and, and I'll come on to, to the, the current thinking about why some, some people react and other people don't. Now, as I mentioned, we also see patients who have food allergies. And food allergies are more common, as I said at the start, in patients who have atopic eczema. 
And in most people with food allergies, the way they react is, is, is not by getting worsening of their eczema, although some people do have worsening of their eczema. Most people with food allergies react in a different way. They react by having, uh, and when they have the food within a few minutes, they might develop an immediate rash, which looks like a nettle rash, nettle sting, and it might be widespread. They might get swelling, they might get swelling of the lips and the tongue and sometimes the throat, and that can be associated with difficulty breathing. And sometimes they might have a severe reaction where they drop their blood pressure, uh, and, uh, and we call that anaphylaxis. So these here would be a top few things that, of patients that we see here in, in our department who, who might have that spectrum of clinical reactivity. Now some people, and it's quite rare I think, but I, I believe that it's, it's the case, some people don't believe it, I do believe it's the case. Some people uh, um, who have eczema uh, and they have a particular food, the food can actually make their eczema a bit worse. But in, in general, most people with eczema, the dominant driver are things in the air, so airborne allergens. House dust mite is perhaps the commonest thing in the air of the list that I uh, just uh, gave. And house dust mite is a, a ubiquitous mite. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's present in high levels in soft furnishings, so in our, our beds, in our, our sofas. Uh, there are high levels of house dust mite, and it feeds on, on dead human skin cells. So it produces substances which degrade human skin. So it's perhaps not surprising then that when it comes into contact with the skin that it causes damage and causes inflammation to the skin. And that leads on to, to uh, one of the explanations for why uh, the, the prevalence of atopic eczema has, has changed. Uh, and, and with our different uh, living conditions, with more central heating, we also have different uh, frequencies of pet ownership now. Uh, we have different levels of allergen exposure. So one idea is that with altered allergen exposure, we're getting altered uh, uh, frequency of atopic eczema and other allergic disease. Another hypothesis, as you may be aware, is that altered infections, altered hygiene, and altered use of antibiotics might in some way be contributing. The idea being that in early childhood, our, our, the, the theory at least, is that infections might be in some way protective against subsequent allergic disease. This is all quite, still quite controversial and very difficult to prove because people with eczema and people with asthma are, are more susceptible to getting infections. So they might have more infections, they might have more use of antibiotics. So it's quite difficult to disentangle cause and effect for some of these things. And the other factor that's certainly changed is the, the our exposure to irritants. Our bathing practices have changed in the last 20 or 30 years. In, in practice, it's probably not going to be a single explanation. This is a complex set of diseases, and, it, and, and, and patient, individual patients are going to be different. So it may be a combination and it may of these things, and it may be other factors that we haven't considered. So why do individuals with atopic eczema react to environmental challenges such as house dust mite, whereas other people don't react to house dust mite even uh, if the skin is challenged with house dust mite and exposed to house dust mite. Well, to answer this, we have to, uh, well, it might help, I think, to go into the structure of the skin. And, and this is a histology or, or pathology slide. So when we take skin biopsies, which we do all the time in dermatology, where we're not sure what's, what's going on, um, we, we take a skin biopsy and we send it off to the pathology department at the John Radcliffe, and they take skin sections. And this is what would come back, and we meet in our histology meeting, and we discuss and try and interpret the skin, the, 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 what, what we're seeing down the microscope. So this is what it would look like. And what you're seeing here is a cross-section of the skin. So out here is the, is, would be the air, the outer surface of the skin. And then you go gradually deeper down. This first sort of darker pink layer is the epidermis, the most superficial layer of the skin. And then as you go further down, we have the dermis. And then if we went further down into the body, the next layer down would be the subcutaneous fat. And then still further down, you'd have muscle tissue, fibrous tissue. So this is really very, very superficial what you're looking at here. This is probably one to two millimeters in depth. So it's really very, very superficial layer of the, of the skin you're looking at under the microscope here. And what you've got here, first of all, I'll just take you, take you down through this. Out here, you can see this sort of uh, 
uh, uh, layer which is perhaps not entirely in, in contact with the skin. This is what a skin flake would look like or a skin scaling would look like under the microscope. It's, it's, it's composed of dead human skin cells and skin protein, the main skin protein at that point, which is, phalag um, which is keratin. And when, when uh, dead cells and, and keratin stick together, they look like this under the microscope and clinically would look like a skin flake. The next bit down here is this darker pink layer of the epidermis now. And this darker pink layer is thought to be particularly important for the barrier function of the skin. And, and it's that part that seems to be slightly weaker in patients with eczema, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And then we go down into the main part of the epidermis. Here you can see that the background color of the, the, the epidermis is slightly pale, say compared to over here. And it's pale because in this area, there's a bit of fluid in the epidermis. And you remember I mentioned at the start, if, sometimes if the fluid is sufficiently marked, then actually you'll get a little blister forming there. And then you probably won't be able to make out, but you just might be able to make out slight red small dots here. Those are red blood cells. So they're, blood, they're cells in, in the blood, and that's a clue that there's a very superficial blood vessel up there at, the, at, at those points. And that superficial blood vessel is opened up, it's dilated. So that blood flow is, is, is increased right at the top of the skin, giving it the red appearance. And then as we go down into the dermis down here, you'll see there's, there's different parts of the dermis. There's this pink material. The pink material is collagen. And collagen helps give the structure to the skin. It's one of the things which is lost as we get older, uh, along with elastic tissue. And, and, uh, uh, and cosmetic companies spend a lot of time trying to, to, to improve the collagen. And then the other uh, feature I wanted to point out to you, and I'll come back to in a little bit more detail in a moment, are all these black dots. These black dots are, are, are the nuclei, so the center of cells that have come into the dermis. Normal dermis would look like this here, very sparse cells, just a few scattered cells. But these here, these areas here, represent a significant infiltration of immune cells. So they wouldn't normally be there. They're, they're coming in, they're responding to something, and then causing the inflammation and, and contributing to the disease. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But what I wanted to, to uh, draw your attention to first is the main uh, component of this barrier function uh, role of this outer epidermis, this dark pink area. And, and the, the main uh, uh, protein that gives us the barrier function, or at least contributes to the barrier function, is a protein called filaggrin. So here we've zoomed into the epidermis. This is the epidermis here, so corresponding to, to this bit here. And filaggrin is stained with a dark color, so a dark black color. So where you're seeing the dark black, that's where filaggrin is. So filaggrin is, is present in that outer part of the epidermis and, and is, is thought to be important for barrier function. And it's filaggrin that seems to be deficient in patients who have atopic eczema. So atopic, patients with atopic eczema have less filaggrin in their outer skin, so they have less barrier function in their, in their outer skin. And it turns out that at least a proportion of patients with severe eczema have mutations in the gene that, that, that codes for filaggrin. And filaggrin is, is thought to have a role in skin barrier, it's thought to have a role in skin hydration, and it's thought to have antibacterial role as well. And indeed, patients with eczema, as I said, are more susceptible to having skin infections. So if you have an impaired skin barrier, then house dust mite, other allergens, irritants will get into the skin, will get down to levels which, which the skin is now recognizing as, a, as, a, as danger, as something it's just the, the immune system has got to respond to. And as I said, uh, we, we can see that, at least initially, by an infiltration of, of uh, these cells, these immune cells. And when we look more closely, we'll zoom in and zoom in still further. We can see, just about make out at this magnification, that the nuclei of these cells is, are, are small and round, and the cells themselves are, are, small, are, are just a little bit larger than the nucleus. They're small and round. And that, that feature of those particular cells is a type of cell which we call a lymphocyte. And that's a, a, a common cell which is, is important for defense against infection. So its normal role in the body is to protect us from infections. But in patients with eczema, that lymphocyte, which is normally there to help protect us from infections, is now reacting to things in the environment and contributing to that inflammation. 
And so I, I was going to mention a few things about how lymphocytes work. And to do that, we have to go down in, in, uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, magnification. So this would be a human hair. If you lined up human hairs, you'll get about five or 10 in one in millimeter. And, and actually a house dust mite picture here is, is not much wider than a human hair. You'll get about five or so, three to five or so in a millimeter. And a lymphocyte is, this is now a, a, a group of lymphocytes there in that little box just to give you a scale, is, is another order of magnitude smaller. So if we zoom in on those lymphocytes, now if you lined up lymphocytes, these are the, 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 the yellow and the green cells here with red blood cells in the background, you can get about 100 or 200 of those in one millimetre if you line those up. And there are two main types of lymphocytes that help defend us against infections. One type is a B cell. And the main role of B cell and a related family member called a plasma cell, the main role of a B cell is to produce antibody. So you may know that when you have an infection, you produce an antibody to that infection, to that organism, and then that in theory, then protects you if you are then exposed to that, 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 that uh, organism, that, that bug, uh, again in the future. In the same way, when we get a vaccination, often in, for many vaccines, when we have the, when the vaccination, we, our body produces antibodies to that vaccine strain so that when we're exposed to the real, or the real virus or the real bacteria in, in, in months or years to come, we've already got an antibody there to protect us. And there's different types of antibody. But, but the type that, that's relevant to atopic eczema and allergic disease is IgE. And IgE is thought to have its main role in defending us against parasites. So in years gone past, parasite infections used to be a big problem for, 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 for humans in, in, in the UK. It still is in other parts of the world. But now parasites are much less of a problem, but IgE is now part of the system that, that's contributing to inflammation in the skin. And I'll, I'll um, take you through that in the next couple of slides. But the other cell I wanted to mention, the other type of lymphocyte that is really crucial for defense against infection is a T cell. And the T cell has many different roles, one of which is to coordinate. It's sort of a, uh, a controlling cell that coordinates a lot of other aspects of the immune system. And, uh, and other, another role for T cells is they can kill virally infected cells. They can also kill tumor cells. So, so uh, if we get infected by a virus or some, with some tumors, actually our T cells are killing that tumor in the early stage. Um, and they're killing the virally infected cells. And I thought I'd show you this. This is uh, a, a video that one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Professor Zhu, uh, 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 has taken of, of T cells. T lymphocytes and what they do to a virally infected cell. Um, and I'll just run it for a few seconds and then stop it just to, just to orientate you. So what we've got here, and I'll run it a couple of times, only 20 seconds or so, but you've got two cells under the microscope here. We've got large cells here and out here and here and here, which are the virally infected cells. And then we've got a lot of other cells, which is difficult to make out. There's so many of them, but they're small and bright. So these are the lymphocytes. So, uh, so in this image here, there's a, a large virally infected cell sitting underneath a whole swarm of lymphocytes. And actually, when you get your eye in, you'll see that there's a lot of lymphocytes around. And you can see that the lymphocytes are recognizing that it's a virally infected cell and are killing it. And that's probably happening in all of us as we speak right now. Our T cells are, are killing uh, cells that have got infected by virus. Let's say we got infected by a cold virus. Our T cells are doing that in our, our throat, in our tonsils uh, as we speak. And often that is happening well before you're getting any clinical symptoms. So this is going on all the time, subclinically, each time we get, uh, we get exposed to, to different infections. So I'll just run that again. There's a low power, and then we zoom in at high power. So if you just keep your eye on this cell here, this large cell, and just see it's being, there's a swarm of, of lymphocytes around that cell, just killing it. And in that way, it's stopping the means by which the virus is able to replicate and infect other cells. 
So let's get back to our, our patient now and, uh, and our, our symptoms and how those T cells and B cells might respond to an, al an allergen that might be coming through the skin or in the, in the same would apply through the, through the uh, airway through, so for, for asthma and for other allergic disease. So we've got our allergen, let's say it's house dust mite, and it's getting through a weakened barrier and it's getting through into the deeper layers of the skin, which is, which is sort of an unacceptable situation for the immune system. The, bod the body starts to make uh, antibody, <coughs> IgE antibody. So this, this, this stick-like structure here is an IgE antibody, and this is house dust mite, the blue structure here. And the IgE antibody binds to the, to the house dust mite particle or fragment of house dust mite and tries to is trying to neutralize it. And it would be doing the same if it was a parasite. So if there was a parasite there, the IgE would be trying to coat it to try and neutralize it. But what happens if the IgE has bound to a fragment of house dust mite is that IgE has got a, like a lock and key, can fit into a receptor on another family of cells which is important in this process called mast cells. And there's other related cells, eosinophils. But mast cells, I wanted to illustrate this with uh, mentioning mast cells. And if that, if, that lock, if that key on the IgE fits into the lock of the mast cell, then it causes that mast cell to become activated. So what I've got here is a picture of a mast cell now with IgE fitting into the, the, the key, fitting into the lock. And we've got house dust mite here shown as these little hexagons here now. And if, if that IgE and, he, and, the, and the house dust mite binds to the mast cells, it activates the mast cells. And the consequence of the mast cell being activated is that they degranulate. So mast cells, when they're resting and prepared, they're full of granules. And in those granules are very potent inflammatory chemicals. They're ready, these mast cells are ready to go. They're ready to fire. All they need is a signal. And then if they get that signal, they will fire. And the way they fire is they release the contents of those granules into the tissue around them. And those granules contain many different factors, but, but some that are particularly important for allergic disease are histamine, then a family of molecules called cytokines, which I'll come back to later, but these signal danger to other cells, and then other factors such as another family of molecules called prostaglandins. And again, I'll come back to that later as well. So what is the consequence in the skin of the mast cells degranulating and releasing the contents of the granules into the surrounding area? Well, it, many of the features that we've described can happen. So the, the blood vessels can open up, they can dilate, so the, blood, so the skin becomes red. The blood vessels become a bit leaky, so fluid can come out of the blood vessels so that you get the fluid in the skin. This can be incredibly itchy, and you can get infiltration of the lymphocytes that, we, that I talked about. And the mast cells are normally trying to do this to help defend against the parasites. But also the same will be happening when, it, when there's allergen exposure or allergen getting through a weakened skin barrier. And as I said, this gives rise to some of the features that we've described. We get the redness, we can get the fluid in the skin, and we can get the intense itching that we see with atopic uh, eczema. And as I mentioned, a very similar process can happen with, with food allergy. But in, on the whole, with food allergy, there's a different spectrum of, of clinical reactivity. So patients with, with, uh, who are allergic to foods, uh, so they eat the food, and the IgE, they, the food, little bit of food gets through the gut lining, and the IgE binds that, binds to the mast cells, the mast cells degranulate, and we get this appearance of hives, like, looks like a nettle sting. And we call that urticaria. And in some patients, we can, we can also get swelling, so deeper swelling, not just the superficial swelling. We get the deeper swelling, and we call that angioedema. And then in other patients, if there's airway involvement in the lungs, then the, the, these mediators, these inflammatory mediators from mast cells and other cells, cause the airways to constrict, so they narrow. And if you get narrowing of the airways, then you start to get wheeze. That can give you the wheeze-type symptoms. And you can also get mucus being produced, so there might be mucus uh, uh, symptoms. And then, as I said, we also see patients who really at severe end of the spectrum who have anaphylaxis. So here, these mediators are not just being released locally, they're being released into the bloodstream. And then you get the, blood, the main blood vessels opening up. And when you get the main blood vessels opening up, that drops your blood pressure. 
and then you can get uh, symptoms like anaphylaxis. And so that's how we, uh, we, we um, uh, um, diagnose clinically patients with atopic eczema and how we're thinking that the process occurs of allergen reactivity leading to the, to the disease. I wanted just to, 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 to do uh, one slide on our current treatment for atopic eczema because it's pretty inadequate, as many of you will know. But when we see a patient, we make, try and make the diagnosis and then we assess whether they've got mild, moderate, or severe disease, depending on the extent of the disease and the severity of the symptoms. And once we've made a, a, uh, a um, uh, decision about the level of severity, we then have a number of treatment options available to us. And this is the sort of ladder that we, that we use in, in, in cases of interest. We often start with moisturizers or emollients. And moisturizers are probably uh, acting as a bit of a, having a bit of a barrier function to the skin. Uh, they're hydrating, obviously, and they, they, they give a bit more flexibility to the skin, and that, that seems to be uh, uh, beneficial and important. But in many patients, we have to use topical steroids, corticosteroids. Many of you will have heard of these, and, if, and probably many have used them, but things like Eumovate, Betnovate, Dermovate. And what these do is they're, they're anti-inflammatory, so they damp down the immune response component in, in the skin. But as, again, as many of you all know, they have their own side effects. They can thin the skin. So we can't use them at very high, very high potency, very strong ones, and we can't use them for very long periods. So we're just sort of managing things as we go along. We're just suppressing it rather than curing the condition, which is unsatisfactory. And if that doesn't work, we then go on and we can use other immune suppressants. So there's something called tacrolimus that we can use in a cream form. Sometimes for the children in particular, we use bandaging. We can use phototherapy, so ultraviolet light. Turns out that ultraviolet light on the skin has a slight immunosuppressive action, so that can also help. We don't use it often, but sometimes. And then we've got various, what we call systemic therapy. So those are tablets where we uh, are dampening down the systemic, the whole immune system. And again, we don't like doing that unless you know, things are really very, very severe. Because by dampening down the whole immune system, obviously that is going to bring other potential problems and risks. So there's a definite need for better, safer uh, treatments for atopic eczema. So that's a, 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 a lead up to, to uh, just another uh, five or ten minutes on what we're trying to do. Uh, in uh, the, the, uh, the department here in dermatology in the laboratory at the, in, at the university to try and understand what's going on with uh, uh, atopic eczema, what's, what the cells in the skin are recognizing, how they're recognizing uh, those uh, challenges, and how we might, by understanding that pathway, how we might identify places that we can block that pathway. And what we found quite recently, uh, about three or four years ago, that not all of the lymphocytes in the skin were T cells or B cells. So this was a big surprise and went against all of the, the sort of the prevailing understanding about immunology, not only of the skin, but immunology elsewhere. And around 20% or so of the lymphocytes, the cells that were infiltrating, weren't B cells or T cells. So it was a bit of a, a mystery population of cells. So we went to the literature and went to uh, for various other clues from other uh, systems. And it turned out that these uh, uh, lymphocytes, which weren't T cells or B cells, were a new family of lymphocytes called innate lymphoid cells, only just been recognized in the last few years. And the way that we tried to understand what those innate lymphoid cells were doing was to, to take skin biopsies. And again, many of you will know this, but skin biopsies is, is, is a procedure that takes five or 10 minutes, put some local anesthetic in the skin, and then we can just take a little core or area of skin, and then we put a stitch in afterwards. And that area of skin, we can then break up and isolate the cells out of there and try and work out what they are and what they're, what they're doing. And when we did this for patients with atopic eczema and our healthy controls, we saw that in patients with eczema, there were a higher frequency of the innate lymphoid cells. So what we've got here is along the y-axis is the frequency of the innate lymphoid cells. We call them ILC2. 
and uh, we've got blood and skin either from healthy controls or from patients with atopic dermatitis. So in the blood, we see very, very low frequencies of these cells, almost, almost undetectable. They are present, but very, very low. And there's not much difference between the blood of uh, uh, healthy controls and patients. But in the skin of healthy controls, we do see some of the cells. So they're there in healthy, in all of our skin, there'll be some of these cells. But in eczema lesions, atopic dermatitis, atopic eczema lesions, there's a significantly greater frequency of these cells. So we know they're there. Then the next question has been, what, what are they doing and how are they contributing? But we can add innate lymphoid cells now as a third family of lymphocytes uh, to our pre-existing knowledge about T cells and B cells. And we've done a lot of work over the last two or three years really trying to understand what these innate lymphoid cells are doing and how they're recognizing things and, and, uh, uh, and, and how they respond and, and whether we can interrupt how they respond. And what we can find is that these innate lymphoid cells, ILC, can interact directly with skin cells we, the, called keratinocytes. That's the main skin cell called keratinocytes. And we've worked out many of the ways in which the ILC can interact with keratinocytes. And just for your sort of reference or interest, there are particular molecules that we've discovered that, that, that the skin, uh, the ILCs, the innate lymphoid cells, can interact uh, with uh, uh, keratinocytes. And those are the top two here, NKP30 and, and KLRG1. They also express another molecule called CRTH2, and I'll come back to that in a moment because we think that's really important. But if the, if the ILC is stimulated and activated by a skin cell, it produces many factors, including the, the cytokines. Remember, I mentioned that mast cells can also produce cytokines. And three cytokines which we think are particularly important are called IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. And these are the names, but we, and we know quite a lot about those, uh, those cytokines, and we know how they can contribute to inflammation. And the reason why I'm mentioning those is they're important for understanding new approaches to treatment, which I'll mention in, in, a, in a couple of slides. So by doing this, we're trying to put the pieces of the jigsaw together of, of what's contributing to atopic eczema disease. I've shown you this picture already of mast cells degranulating when they come into contact with IgE and allergen. They release all these potent mediators, histamine, cytokines, and prostaglandins. And one of the prostaglandins is a molecule called PGD2. And it turns out that that prostaglandin D2 binds to CRTH2 on the ILCs. And I mentioned that the, we'd found that the ILCs express CRTH2. And it's a very, very potent activator of, of ILCs. And it causes the ILCs to produce a lot of these cytokines, the IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, which we know can contribute and drive atopic eczema, asthma, and hay fever, and food allergy. And we also know that these cytokines can drive the B cells to start producing more antibody, more IgE. So by identifying these cell populations, we can start to understand how this cycle might, might be occurring in patients and also help us understand opportunities for blocking this process. So we might be able to block how prostaglandin D2 interacts with CRTH2. We might be able to block the function of these cytokines, IL-4, 5, and 13. And to that end, there's some very exciting developments, which I'm pleased to say we are part of, where we're trying to inhibit the effect of some of these uh, molecules. So in this clinical study, this is not our data, this is published uh, literature, but we're doing a clinical trial at the moment of using a, a, a new treatment, a new treatment for atopic eczema, which blocks and inhibits that IL-4. So IL-4, do you remember, was a cytokine produced by innate lymphoid cells. And in this study, what they did here was they treated um, patients with moderate to severe atopic eczema with either uh, the, 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 the new therapy, which is called dupilumab, at different doses and different timing intervals, and they had a placebo group. And what they've got up the y-axis here was um, the, the disease severity. So patients started up here, and then a drop here is the percentage improvement in their disease severity score. The top line is placebo. So even in the absence of active treatment, you'll still have some patients responding and improving. But down here, we've got the 
All of these curves represent the treatment with the, the, new, the new drug dupilumab at different doses. And this uh, 50, 60 percent improvement is really for us, for these individuals with really moderate to severe disease, so very, very difficult uh, for, for, for the patients, widespread involvement. This is really a very dramatic improvement. And the improvement's happening really very early. So even by week one, the patients are starting to see an improvement. So it's really very exciting. And I think just the start of, uh, of many treatments that are, going to, that are going to come through. So we are involved in clinical trials, as I said. And three of the most promising at the moment are, one is a CRTH2 inhibitor. So remember, remember this was on the innate lymphoid cells and responds to prostaglandin D2. And then we've got two approaches to block the downstream effects of the, uh, the, the products of the ILCs, the, the cytokines, IL-13 and, and IL-4. And we hope that these will, will, will prove uh, uh, or prove beneficial. So in summary, atopic eczema is a common inflammatory skin condition for which the current treatments are inadequate. And we've identified a new population of immune cells which can contribute to skin inflammation and such innate lymphoid cells represent a new treatment target, and we're exploring that through several clinical trials within the Oxford uh, uh, BRC, Biomedical Research Center. So I'd like to thank people in, in my team, various uh, clinicians and scientists. Uh, Paul Klenemann is the lead for our immunity and inflammation theme, and as I said at the start, all of our patients, I'm really indebted to our patients. Uh, and we've had uh, funding from the Oxford Biomedical Research Centre, which has, has been fantastic, bringing us together and creating opportunities for, for research, for, for, for patient benefit. And I also have uh, funding through the Medical Research Council. Thank you very much. <laughs>